The Introvert's Edge podcast was designed to create a dialogue around introversion, to stimulate a discussion around our disadvantages, how we overcome those disadvantages, and what we consider our introvert's edge. Together, we're finally going to confront the stigma around introversion, showing that we're not second-class citizens. We're just different, and we need to embrace that. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Introverts Edge podcast. I am actually ecstatic to introduce our next guest, Mike Michalowicz, one of my personal friends and just an amazing person in general, of course another introvert and I have to say a successful business owner himself, two multi-million dollar successful sales of his own, over a million copies of his magnitude of books sold and 25 languages. I mean, just an impressive story. It has some ups and downs and nobody ever believes that he's an introvert, which is exactly what we're talking about often in The Introvert's Edge, which is why I'm so ecstatic to introduce Mike McCullough. Welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for coming. Matthew, it's good to see you again, brother. How are you? I'm, look, I'm doing terrific and I'm, I'm beyond excited for what, you know, I know that you have planned for our audience today. And I, look, before we get into that, I mean, a lot of people really struggle to see you. I know as an introvert, when they see you speak from stage, when they see you on podcasts, but you know, we were on your show together and you were like, well, I draw my energy from being by myself. Sure, I can do these so-called extroverted arena things, but I draw my energy from being by myself. So just so that people don't delude themselves into hearing you, you speak and going, this guy, he's definitely an extrovert. I'd love for you to share a little bit about your kind of, your story, maybe some humble upbringings around, you know, your energy levels and, and kind of how you got to, to where you are today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think I confused originally the definition of introvert and extrovert, that extrovert meant energy, that it meant authority, that it meant exposure. And I learned those are not all components of introversion. There are extroverts who are low energy. There are introverts that are high energy. I, I didn't compute that. And, uh, I'm an introvert. Now, it's a, it's a spectrum, right? I'm, I'm toward the ambivert level. But how I define introversion versus extroversion is the source of energy. That This is coming up in a couple of weeks. A, a friend of my wife, uh, they're having a party, and there's about you know 20 couples going over. And it, it's, it's like the, the quick coin test. You flip a coin, and it lands heads. You're like, yes or no? Instant reaction. The second she told me, hey, we're, we're going to get together with these other couples, I'm like, oh. That little instant is like, okay, th that's a confirmation that I'm an introvert, that it will, it will be very deliberate for me to actively participate. It'll be hard for me to, to, to keep up the energy. I'll be kind of going to my wife, hey, it's time to roll out of here now. Now, the funny thing is I know every single couple that's going. Uh, I'm friends with them all. And if my wife said, hey, we're going out with one other couple for dinner, I'm like, oh, yeah. But it, it's this group dynamic that, that drains me. Um, Conversely, in, in small social situations where it's just one other couple or when I'm by myself, my energy elevates. Now, that simply means that I look to expose myself in ways that increase, increase my energy uh, for that, that sense of, of cl closeness, intimacy, and, and exclusivity just by myself. What I found is you can apply that as an author. Um, and, and it comes out in, in the ways that still drive authority in the traditional sense. Going on stage is a very intimate experience for me. Yeah, there could be hundreds. I've been very fortunate, sometimes have thousands in the audience, but I'm not having to socially network with each person. How are you doing? Tell me your story and let's get going. I just put my story out on out there. It's actually a very, lonely is not the right word, but it's a very exclusive experience. It's just me on stage talking to faces and hopefully engaging and stuff. Writing, I was just writing this morning. I love that, just sitting there and letting thoughts flow and stuff, and it feels so fulfilling. The other thing is, is in regards to energy, um, I have been clinically, and when I say clinically, I have two psychologists in my family, and they both separately diagnosed me to be hypomaniac. Hypomania is a tendency, and I, I wonder if you have it too, Matthew, is where we have this high energy level, almost that we gotta kind of burn it off. So the second I wake up, I'm like, it's go time. And I just keep on going and going. But it doesn't mean that I need to be, it surely doesn't mean I need to be with other people. It's just an energy that's internal. And when I'm alone, uh, when I'm in a small group, I can channel. It's much more effective. Uh, and maybe that's the essence of introversion. It's, it's the channeling of what my natural talents are, are best expressed in small intimate groups. And it becomes kind of muddled in larger groups. 
You know, I think that's really interesting because one of the things I talk about in my books is that if an introvert is talking about what they're truly passionate about, they get energized and they want to be sure. out networking. They want to be speaking from stage. They, they, they want to do everything. Now, that doesn't mean that they uh, potentially can do it well, but they'll be energetic about it. Once they learn the strategies, which I know you share in your books as well, all of a sudden they can do it well and still be energized. But that doesn't mean that they're not exhausted afterwards. And I, I know you talk about uh, this in, in one of your trainings on Introvert You, where you kind of talk about that on-stage experience where you are, you're actually energized by that. And I think a lot of introverts would struggle with that kind of concept because, I mean, surely speaking from stage is terrifying. But for you, you get energized by yeah. that activity. So I'd love for you to share why you think that is, because this is a so-called extroverted arena that everyone assumes that if you're up on stage, you must be extroverted. And I know oh, you yeah. say in the training that so many people you know that are amazing speakers actually happen to be more on the introverted side. Oh yeah, and I would say most are introverts. Um, and I, I think the reason introverts are more successful on stage is because we can go deeper into ourselves. Instead of constantly trying to be the, the king of the party or the queen of the party, we're looking internally and we can express on stage very well. And that forms intimacy and connection. Um, so that's what I found for for most speakers. Now, we all get stage fright. Like, I still get a little bit of it. I, I've, I don't know how many times I've been on stage. Maybe over a thousand times now. I've done it for well over a decade, almost two decades now uh, and often. And... Um, Every time before I get on stage, I still get the butterflies, I still get nervous, I still have that little bit of stage fright. But that is not introversion, extroversion. That's called just being pure human. Like, you're about to go in front of a lot of people, so thoughts race through your mind, like, am I gonna do this right? Am I gonna mess up? But once I get into flow, I actually go look internally. It's like, how do I bring out the most of me? It, it's like a one-person play or one-person performance. Now, just to give context, I've been blessed to be on stage with some of the biggest names in the business space. So, so you know, my books are all business books. So Guy Kawasaki comes to mind, or Michael Gerber, or Seth Godin, or Dave Ramsey, um, are all people that I've been at those events and shared the stage with them. And uh, most of those people, high degree introverts, introverts, extremely effective and energized presenters. Interesting. And I, I know you and I talk openly about ambiversion, introversion, and extroversion. And yeah. it's it's really interesting. When I speak at a, at a lot of events, I'll, I'll get people to fill out a survey about whether they're introverted or extroverted. And quite frequently, I hear things like, oh, I used to be extroverted, but, you know, due to the, the pandemic, I find myself being more introverted or like that's possible. And then, you know, during, um, you know, obviously I used to be really introverted, but don't worry, I'm extroverted now. Again, right. like that's possible because there seems yeah. to be this situation where people almost feel like they're embarrassed to say that they're introverted. And that's why I'm, tr I'm trying to combat that yeah. as much as possible. But what I find is, and, and you know, I think that there's this, this line where extroverts potentially aren't the best listeners, they're not the most empathetic, but they can learn those strategies. Introverts, on the other hand, can learn to speak, can learn to network. And what happens is everyone starts to move with training and education and coaching to this middle path, which we, we're open to now calling ambiversion. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear what your thoughts are from a growing up perspective. Did you find that you were a lot more uh, more quiet growing up? Did you find that there were some things that you struggled with that you had to spend some work really learning to 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 change yourself to to become who you are today? Yeah, there's definitely skills. I, you know, it's funny when looking back at my uh, early days, I, I don't remember much. So it's all stories from my mother, but I've observed my own son. My youngest son grew up and he had what's called selective autism. Selective autism. Uh, this isn't necessarily point to introversion or extroversion, but what it is is a fear to be uh, exposed publicly or, or engaged publicly with in any format. So as a young child, like if a stranger came up and said, "Oh, what's your son's name?" he'd hide behind my wife's leg and be sitting there. And uh, he was diagnosed with selective autism. And what the uh, instructor or the clinician suggested is, when a stranger comes up, you you got to invoke play. So invite people. Hey, come up, just tickle him and, and play around to start expanding him. Well, fast forward, he's now 20 years old. Uh, he shows up and he can engage, but he, actually, I think my whole family are introverts. He is an introvert, but uh, he's highly engaged, uh, highly presentable and so forth. Myself, uh, you know, when I started my speaking career, I knew that I was, I was becoming an author and that I needed to speak. It also, and I, and I wanted to be an extraordinary speaker. There was no question about it, but I knew I had to kind of cut my teeth on this. So I started speaking at my church. Um, and what I did, is I went to the pastor of our church and said, hey, uh, do you want someone to do the, the reading from the Bible? 
and no one was volunteering for it. We have a very small community church, and like no one would volunteer for it. So I'm like, I'll do it. And uh, he said, okay, uh, that'd be great. And then I said, I'll do it again. I did it over and over again. And I, and I learned. I, I didn't, I remember the first reading I did, I didn't read the verse ahead. I was like, oh, I can just read it. I didn't know how to pronounce those biblical names. I was like, well, Je- Jehaza, what? So I started to learn. And I remember the very first time I went up, my face went beat red and I was just like shaking. But I got it out. And some words, someone after me came up to me and to say, hey, good job being up there. And it started to give me some confidence. I think no matter who we are, the, the introversion, the extroversion is just our orientation. We have to build the skill. I, I've seen extroverts um, who go up and, and they're just as horrible the first go around at doing that presentation or, or doing that reading. So the skills can be developed by anyone. It's just we have a certain orientation, but that doesn't affect our ability to perform as long as you practice over and over again. That's terrific. And thanks for sharing that, Mike, because I know a lot of people are terrified of getting on stage. And sometimes it's just really important for people like us to say, us too, and it's okay. And I'm, I'm, really, glad, I'm really glad that you shared that. I think one of the other things that introverts are always focused on, and I talk about it in my books all the time, about being authentic and congruently yourself. And I think that one of the things that your story really kind of elucidates is that you can be authentic, even if your life's kind of been a bit of a roller coaster. I mean, you talk yeah. openly about the fact that, I mean, two multi-million dollar sales is huge, but then you had a bit of a hiccup and then you had to get up on <laughs> stage and still speak from a point of authenticity and comfort. Yeah. How, well, do you want to share a little bit about what that hiccup was and how you kind yeah. of had to rebuild yourself from a mental perspective? Yeah, and, and I, I'll argue it's a necessity to expose uh, our our challenges that we face in life, our hiccups. So mine was more than a hiccup. It was just a, a pure disaster brought upon myself by myself. So I, I built and sold some companies early on. I'm a, I'm a self-made millionaire in my early 30s. I got it all figured out, I think. My ego was massive. I'm like, oh, I'm a genius. Mm. Well, I started a third business that I had no understanding for what I was doing. I, I was an angel investor. And it just it was a cool term, and that's why I did it. I went in with pure ignorance. And so I started all these businesses, I invested in all these startup companies, and they all failed. Not because the people I was investing in or the ideas I was investing in were bad. I was clueless. And, and they weren't complimentary. I was just like, oh, there's a good idea. It was pot shots. Well, within six months, I wiped out everything. It wasn't just these investments. I blew it on arrogance, too. I wanted to have the fastest car. I wanted to have a place out in Hawaii. I wanted all the things. And um, I had to come home and face my family and tell them that we're going to lose our house. We lost it 30 days after uh, I hit rock bottom financially. And then uh, my daughter, she was nine at the time, felt compelled to save me by presenting her piggy bank. She said, Daddy, since you can't provide for the family, I will. It was like a dagger through my heart. Um, that story, though, be- that's, that moment became the seedling for change for me. And uh, it's so critical that we share this. There's a concept called the Pratt Fall Effect. And what this research shows is that when someone in a position of prestige or celebrity ship shows their human side, they actually become more um, desirable. We, we, we feel more compelled to engage with them. So when you see that blooper reel at the end of the movie, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm falling in love with these people because they're real humans. But we all have this responsibility. If we show that perfect self, that perfect presence on social media, here's yet another amazing meal, here's another amazing day and sunset, it actually disassociates the people from us. If we show some of the real ugliness, we actually become more palatable because we're showing the pratfall effect. That, that's really great advice. And look, I know you've gone on to, to charge, I mean, you're up to what, 30,000, I think you talk about in speaker fees. And yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you're constantly coaching and your work, especially through Profit First, is getting implemented into you know, hundreds of thousands of businesses, yeah. which is unbelievable. <laughs> but you had to really pull yourself up and say, Firstly, I'm willing to be open and honest about the fact that my, my, my successes are great, but I, I had some pretty significant things that happened that yeah. are perhaps negative that other people may judge me on. But totally. it's okay because my willingness to be honest is my, also my ability to help others. And I think this is really critical for introverts that are listening because a lot of introverts want to shield themselves from external judgment. 
and they want to have pre present the best version of themselves, which leads to that perfection mentality on social media, on speaking from stage, which is why none of that ever seems to happen. So yeah. help me understand, because I know that you had to, you know, you, you went through some, some depression when this all happened, and then you had to rebuild yourself. What advice would you give people that have had these negative situations or just can't seem to get themselves to take that step forward to really trust in themselves and that yeah. being vulnerable is actually going to lead to positive, not negative, feedback. Yeah, I, I would start off by saying that we're all judging all everyone around us all the time. You are judging me, I'm judging you. And that, that's not a negative thing. But the second we see each other, judgment comes about. Oh, I like the shirt. Oh, I don't like the shirt. Oh, the, here, the style. Whatever. It's always going on. It's just the, the human experience. So there is no avoiding judgment. It's necessary for the human experience. So then to carve out certain spots and hide it, um, you're still being judged. The interesting thing is when we reveal something that is could be ugly or or was difficult or puts us in a position that that kind of lowers our standard, if that's the right choice of words, we become more compelling. Um, there's this concept I call the Phoenix effect. But if you watch a movie like with like a Tom Cruise or something like that, these action movies will start off always the same way. The opening scene, everything's perfect. Um, you know. He's Tom Cruise walking down the beach. He looks amazing. His wife looks amazing. His children look amazing. The beach, everything, the dog's amazing. That's the opening scene. The problem is that's what we're seeing in social media. If you only did that, if everything's always amazing, at a certain point, we're like, ah, that's not me. It's not approachable. I'll never have it. Tom Cruise sucks. So what the movie will do within five minutes is I'll go into this immediate collapse. Wife is murdered by some long distance uh, sniper. You know, kid, some kidnappers come up and they take the kids. They beat the crap out of Tom Cruise. And and the, the lowest part of that scene will be Tom Cruise laying on the ground, blood coming out of his mouth, the ocean wave kind of washes it out and they fade to black. They're showing the arc of what his life was like in the reality. They're showing the beauty and the ugliness. Then the rest of the movie is the revenge or the, you know, he's avenging the death of his wife. He's recovering his children. We're now along for the ride because we're like, He's got, he had a great life. His life was way worse than I've ever experienced. So therefore, somewhere in between, he was like me or he is like me. Therefore, I'm a champion for him. So we have a responsibility to show the greatness, not in a braggadocious way, but in a visionary way. You know, I'm very public about my mission to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. That's why I honestly believe I've been put on this planet is to serve other entrepreneurs. And I have a grand vision for how many people will serve and a grand expectation for myself. I put that out there. And I show the, the blood coming out of the mouth and the ocean wave over me because it's, it's true in the reality. And I also know somewhere between those, the vision and the reality of struggles I've had that someone says, oh, this guy is like me. I get it. And now they're along for the journey. We all have this. And so we're, it's necessary to point to that and then engage our audience to come along with us on the journey so that we can serve them. Absolutely. I, th I think it's it's so critical. I, you know, one of the things that I do in my presentations is I put this photo up and it took me a lot of time to get confident enough to do this. I put this photo up at my sister's wedding and it's me with terrible acne and I talk about my discomfort. And I now make a joke beforehand. I say, I'm only going to show you this slide for three seconds. No kidding, three seconds. I switch it on, I switch it off. People laugh and I move on. And that for me was horrifying the first time yeah. I, I did it. And then I realized that by bringing myself down a peg, it's the only way I can get Get other people to rise with me yes. and it's so so critical to, to, to what we do and I you know I know we've got an interview coming up together on the quietly influential yes. summit and I really want to go into detail on I mean you had this issue where if you lost everything and had to come back but you started speaking at that time where you were like well here I am and I've now got you know come you know watch me as I, I rise almost where I know a lot of people are like well I come from nothing or I've had these things that have gone wrong you know how do I get up on stage and speak from authority? So I, I'm really interested in talking more about that. But what I, th I think for today, I'm, I'm really interested. I mean, your new book is you know called Get Different. And mm -hmm. I think for introverts, being different is, is scary. And you talk right. about differentiation, <laughs> attraction, and you know making sure that you connect with people. And Correct. I really believe that a lot of those chinks in the armor is how we do that. I'd love for yeah. you to share a little bit about the book, how you think that the, the concepts may, may help the introverted audience, um, but also how their introversion may play towards or against them applying those strategies. Yeah, I think it serves it. You know, the long title could have been Be Yourself Because It Is Different. Um, 
you know, do you because the others don't do you and you'll stand out. Those are other alternative titles. Um, and you'll see over my shoulder here, my left shoulder, it says, be yourself. Um, the essence of distinguishing ourselves is not to change who we are. It's actually to comply with who we naturally are because no one else is like you. It was Oscar Wilde who said, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. What I see in all markets, the speaker industry too, is that we, we very quickly all kind of dilute ourselves to the common standard. This is how presenters present. Tell a story, uh, then back it up with a message, then tell another story, back it up with another formula. You know, tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. Tell them what you told them. And we, we go into this formic approach and we say, that's, that's the standard, therefore I need to be that. But at the same time, it's not truly who we are. There's something that's off kilter. And humans are really good at sensing this. We all know when something or someone is a phony. Not, not like, oh my God, that's so fake. Just a little, something says a little off. It says, mm, or I've heard this before, or eh. The fact is all of us have a distinct differentiation about ourselves if we really lean into it. One of my favorite introverts of all time on the stage is Brene Brown. Like the authority of introversion. And uh, look at the audience she's commanding. I remember watching her TED or TEDx speech where she said, she did this presentation and she called her friend and said, I don't know what I'm gonna do here. A hundred people are gonna see this and I don't know how I'm gonna deal with it. And the next morning she goes on there and it wasn't a hundred, it was a hundred thousand. And she was ready to figuratively kill herself. She was, she was so overwhelmed. And look at what she's done and look at the positivity she's brought to the world and the engagement of people. Because she was true to herself, if you watch Brene Brown out there the whole time, you're like, that's Brene Brown. You read her book, that's Brene. And it's her style. There's no one else in the world like her. And what she simply did was double down herself. I invite everyone is to double down yourself, be more of you. I'll, I'll give one final story, um, not on the stage of speaking, but on the stage of sales. I was working with a bookkeeper who said, I love numbers so much. Um, but I show no emotion. I have a very flat affect. I know I'm supposed to get charged up when I'm on a phone call and say, we've got this and we're going to get your numbers going. She goes, but I, it's so hard for me to do that because that's not who I am. So I said, okay, to get different, we're going to just be more of you. What, what character, what kind of public character are you most like? She's like, I'm Spock. She goes, I'm so logical. We said, that, that's your angle. She started every time before she started a phone call, she'd say, before we go into your numbers and before I tell you about my services, I just want you to know I'm like Mrs. Spock. She goes, I love the numbers so much that I will have a flat effect. You won't feel emotion. It's me just processing numbers, but I will find the answers to your business's needs here. So I hope that's okay. I'm Mrs. Spock. Her conversion rate, uh, I think it more than tripled just by framing people to her natural true self, by being more of herself, by leaning into it, people say, oh, She's not disengaged. She isn't bored. She is so engaged. They just need that framing. I think that's not an opportunity for all of us to be more of ourselves. That is how we differentiate and to put a label to it so people say, oh, I get you. I get why you're different and how it'll serve me. Absolutely. And I, I think that this is critical for a lot of introverts because, you know, it's funny. I speak at a lot of accounting events, a lot of, you know, people in IT, and they're always like, yeah. there's nothing different about me. I'm exactly like everybody else. And the truth is they're not. They've got different yeah. life experiences, different upbringings, different past customers that qualify them to help a demographic of people, but also qualify them to help them in a unique way because they're different. And I think that what commonly happens is we join these association groups, we join, which are great for learning how to systemize our business, but you can't do your marketing and your sales exactly the way everybody else does it. Otherwise, you're a commodity and you're going to constantly have to barter on price. So it's your uniqueness that you don't talk about in those groups that make you different. I mean, let's be honest, Mike and I are friends, but we also have books that talk about a lot of similar stuff. They kind of overlap. Yeah. Like my introvert's edge to networking teaches introverts how to be different in the networking room. Why right, would right. I Tell ever me. invite Mike to be on this podcast and talk about getting different? Because the answer is we are different. And we right. know that my advice will help a certain demographic and Mike's will help a certain demographic. And sometimes you'll need to hear it from both of us. And one of you will read my book first and then resonate with Mike. And then some of you will read Mike's book and resonate with me. What you'll find right. that's interesting is both of them focus on planning and preparation. Prepare your difference to make sure that you're not being different in an unprepared way when you're in a networking room or when, you, when, you, when, when you're from stage so that you don't see it as a chink but an advantage in 
what you do to serve your business and your ideal prospects that will not listen to anyone else. Which is why, you know, I, I can't recommend Mike's books enough. Now, Mike, I want to give everyone an opportunity to, to discover you and your work. But before we get to that, I have to ask you the question I always ask on the Introvert's Edge podcast. What do you consider your Introvert's Edge? I love doing research, but around specific stuff. When I find something complex, it overwhelms me. Actually, I feel an anxiety around it. Um, I love to find the simple solution to complex things. And that's become the essence of all my work. How do I make all these accounting documents and stuff that make me want to go crazy? Uh, how do I bring that to the essence of what drives profitability? How do I do all these things that my business needs for me to make my business run on automatic? And how do I boil it down to one step to make my business start running on automatic itself? So th that's my introvert's edge. I can make the complex simple. That's, that's terrific. And I, th I think from a lot of introverts that are probably listening, making the complex simple is something that we have to do a lot of times for the people that aren't so inwardly focused to understand what they need to understand to implement the advice we're giving them or the reports that we're giving them. So that's tremendous advice and I appreciate you sharing. And you know, Mike, I know you've got an amazing new training that, um, that you developed for Introvert You, and I'd, I'd love for you to spend a second just talking about that, but I'd also love for, for people to, you know, to, to know a little bit more about where they can find you, where you'd suggest they start, because there is a, a world of Mike McCullough, it's not a sure. single place. Where would you direct them to start their journey in finding out more about you. Yeah, so the, the starting spot is gogetdifferent.com. So it's the word go, G-O, and then getdifferent.com. Um, there's resources for the book. There's, there's, I think we now have 70 or 80 ways to start a little different experiments that amplify who you are. Uh, you don't even need the book to get started. So you can get started immediately on getting noticed, but getting noticed in a way that's coherent with who you are. And then with the university, I was so pumped to teach it because there's certain I think hacks to getting started as a speaker specifically that very few people know or do. I discovered because I I was uncomfortable following the traditional path, right? This is part about getting different. Every, and I'm putting air quotes around this, but every speaker said, oh, you need to get an agent or you need to solicit different entrepreneurial organizations that you need to speak to. And I'm like, this it feels icky and it doesn't feel consistent with me. But I found there's a way to speak through colleges. And what I was blown away was that with no book, no experience speaking, I could get paid gigs, which for me were pretty substantial, 2000 3000 sometimes $5,000 from a university for an hour presentation. I could get PR where a university like harvard.edu is backlinking to my site and talking about my presentation topic. I could, when I had books, get books into circulation with that university. Some of my books are taught at, actually many of my books are taught at Pepperdine. Uh, I have one taught at Columbia, and all because of this process. So. In the training, I intimate the exact steps. This isn't like theoretical stuff. This is the exact step. Call this person, give them this script, ask them for this. That will stage you to start your speaking career, particularly if you're an introvert. You know, I, th I thank you so much for sharing that, Mike. And I, I have to tell you, I, I asked Mike to do this um, uh, not long ago, actually. And he was, yeah. he was like, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm happy to. And I went, oh, Mike, Mike's probably going to phone it in. You know, he's such a big name. This video series, I took a ton of notes. I actually have them here. Um, I took a ton of notes because I'm like, oh my gosh, why didn't I do this when I first started? I spoke for free. I had to reach out to people. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, yeah. so uncomfortable. I'm like, I didn't know him back then, right? So yeah. I would really recommend people check that out at theintrovertu.com. Uh, sorry, introvertu.com, I should say. And make sure, I mean, there's this cheat sheet for how to do it. And it is crazy how simple it is. And I'm like, anyway, if you ever want to be a speaker or if you ever want to get noticed, then being a speaker is definitely something that you should definitely do. And you can be prepared. There's lots of things that you can do to be ready to be on stage. But if no one invites you, it's kind of hard. So this is a really cool sure. skill set to be able to do that. But that being said, well, of course, I want you to check out, you know, his program on Introvert You. I would love you to check out his book because his book is, it, it will be transformative in your lives. So of course, you know, I, I'd be happy to see you go over to that program, but I want you to invest in his book because I really feel that it's going to allow you to introduce your difference in a way that's comfortable, congruent, and authentic to you in a way that may not have occurred to you up until now. Because as we know, introverts, it's not going to come to us instantly. It takes planning and preparation, which us introverts are terrific at. So make sure you check out Mike's presentation on the Quietly Influential Summit. You can check that out at thequietlyinfluentialsummit.com. And then make sure you check out his book. And what was that link again, Mike? GoGetDifferent.com. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you in the next version of the Introverts Edge podcast. Cheers, everyone. 
I'm Matthew Pollard, the author of The Introvert's Edge to Networking. I'm on a mission to help introverts to be proud of who we are. For the first time, you'll learn a process for networking that feels comfortable and authentic to you as an introvert. A process that doesn't feel salesy or awkward in any way. I saw at least half of my board members, three in particular that I can think of, that now are so comfortable in literally going up to people at events, all of a sudden I can see the confidence. Most of the networking books and literature out there really focus on hardcore tactics designed for extroverts. As introverts, we're different and we need to embrace that. We need a system that allows us to channel our natural introverted strengths into the networking room. You will learn how to be successful at face-to-face -face networking and a masterful online networker on your terms. It's beautifully written and it provides tremendous value. So I, I, I am honored to, to say, folks, if you haven't looked at the book, you really need to check out this guy's book. It's, it's excellent. It gives you that confidence to truly be yourself, knowing that you're gonna be presenting yourself in a way that is authentic and will also really resonate with the person that you're talking with. One of the things you'll love about the Introvert's Edge to Networking is it's jam-packed full of more than 20 stories of introverts just like you. People that have likely started in much tougher spots than where you are right now and how they've leveraged the strategies that you'll be learning to obtain phenomenal career and small business success. I was about to give up on my business. The results started coming in right away. In fact, a year later, the Chamber of Commerce awarded me the business of the year. <laughs> you need to go read his book because everything he does is what people need whether they're an introvert or not. I've been fortunate to receive endorsements from some exceptional introverts like Neil Patel and Ivan Meisner, the founder of the world's largest networking group, BNI. What I love about the Introvert's Edge is that it talks about the things that make an introvert successful. The Introvert's Edge to Networking is going to destroy all of the barriers that you have around whether success in networking is possible for you. Now I'm up to kind of five figures, you know, triple my prices or more. It was like the deals just kept coming in and coming in and it, I mean, it was incredible. Like I had never seen anything like it before. I was able to triple my revenue and that happened within six months. We've gone from 10 million a year to 20 million a year. I wrote The Introvert's Edge to networking after the success of the first in the Introvert's Edge series, which focused on sales. I decided that it was just as important, perhaps even more so, that we had a networking book that was designed to help us as introverts dominate in the networking room and in online networking that was specifically written for us. So if you're an introvert, don't delay. Head to theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking to get access to the first chapter of my new book completely for free today.